Perfect. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining another Winters and Winters interview special. Um, so I'm Michelle Winters. I'm VP of Solutions at Gobi. And I'm also, of course, joined by Dan Winters, head of America's with Grez. But today we also have a special guest. So Beth Richtman is joining us today. Um, so she is currently founder and managing partner at Scion Capital Partners, but previously she was a managing investment director for sustainable investments and also managed a portfolio of real assets at CalPERS. So um, I'm super excited for her to join us today because I think we're gonna have a lot of our conversation on the LP side and the viewpoint from those investors. But before we dive in too much, um, Beth, I'll let you quickly introduce yourself for today. Well, it, it's great to be here with you both, the Winters and Winters Show, and um, and talking about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, sustainability performance uh, for real assets. Uh, it's a topic near and dear to my heart, given um, my roots in in sort of founding the the Grizz infrastructure standards and um, and just you know the importance to investors of really tracking and being able to to manage and, and monitor the sustainability performance of, of real assets is it's just it's such a great topic and there this is such a great tool and an important tool for for the market um, so happy to be here with you all yeah thank you so much for joining i'm really excited for the different perspective that that you're going to be bringing to the table and um, considering that we just went through, so the, the Gresb universe just went through um, submitting for uh, the Gresb assessment back in the end of June, July 1st, um, we thought it'd be important to take a step back into a little bit into the why we go through the Gresb assessment, why it's impactful, um, who's looking at it, uh, who it is that we're communicating to. There's obviously multiple value add components uh, to what Gresb is looking to implement. Um, but today's perspective is going to be from that investor side. So actually, Dan, I'm going to have you kick us off a little bit. Remind us what investors and the institutional investors, what do they see? How do they have access? Why, why is Gresb important to them? Well, it's perfect. So here we are, it's the, it's the end of July and we just closed the assessment. We had record numbers, 25% growth. We've never grown this fast before. So this year we had over 1500 on the real estate side, funds or listed property companies submitted as a, you know, they, they submit their data, they put data into the benchmark. And on the infra side, we had just shy of 150 funds to go with nearly 680 assets and yeah, huge growth on, on both of those. So those are the participants and they've got a, a second quarter phenomena to do this. April 1st to July 1st is when that portal is open. Right now, we are in the process of validating that data, getting ready to release the results at the start of the fourth quarter. That's when what we, you know, our investor members, they are subscribers to the data. And these are the major pension funds from around the world uh, that that will take this data and they use it for manager engagement. They use it for stakeholder reporting, the carbon footprint. You know, I know that's one of the reasons why CalPERS uh, moved ahead with Grez back in mm -hmm. you know, five, six, seven years ago is they signed the Montreal pledge. And that said, hey, we need to do a carbon footprint report of our entire holdings. And this is a $400 billion pension fund. So how do you do that? And that's really hard. So they use the Gresb assessment for real estate and infrastructure as a data gathering tool, as well as engagement. So there's many reasons why LPs will join in and, and subscribe to the data, but it really comes down to two key issues. One is risk management understanding who is doing a, a good job at these issues. And then the other one is looking for business value. How are funds and firms that are managing this capital delivering additional areas of business value with that return stream that they're that everybody wants? Yeah, absolutely. And that was a good, I think, refresher to uh, the little bit into the the why and who and um, what it is that they're they're looking for and and Beth, I'm super curious on your perspective and your experience that you've had with Gres in the past and some of that value that you've pulled out of that maybe in terms of even that performance data component as you're looking at these assets. Um, would love to just hear a little bit into the why, like why are you guys excited from from for Gres from that perspective. Yeah. So, so I remember um, being in South Africa at PRI in 2013 and Claudia Cruze from APG came up to me and said, we need to talk about this. I think you guys should be involved in helping build an infrastructure sustainability standard. And 
It was it was a really interesting time because at, at that time I had joined Calpers in very very at the end of 2012 and then I was working on ESG integration tools for how we were doing underwriting but we really didn't have anything for for you know managing and monitoring assets and so I started working with her and people from PGGM and Ashton Snyder at Aimco and others thinking through well what do we need to do as asset owners how do we understand um, the sustainability performance what are the metrics we could track and there was just a ton of of conference calls and, and really thinking this through um, ultimately to make a long story short we we um, you know we created something called the global infrastructure sustainability council and then brought it to Gres because we thought you know given what, what Gresp had already done on the real estate side, that it seemed like the right platform and the right place to work. And you know, to Dan's point, having our real assets platform where we could you know, not only have our infrastructure, but real estate measured with similar metrics and across one platform enables large scale asset owners like a CalPERS to do something you know, where they can look across a portfolio to get those type of insights. Um, so the types of things that that I found very useful with the, the Gresb um, platform and just this type of survey is that you you are able to create a systematic process and also a coherent process for how you are um, analyzing the sustainability performance of infrastructure assets. And you, you have a timetable. So you're doing it on an annual basis. You can check things from year to year. And one thing I found incredibly valuable that I didn't recognize you know, early on was going to be of value was the fact that asset managers are just inherently competitive people. Mm -hmm. They are. I mean, the reason why someone goes into asset management, something they want to get the returns. I mean, you think about who these people are. I mean, they're always having to be competitive, whether it's sourcing deals, whether it's getting PPAs, you know, power purchase agreements for a, a renewable energy asset, you know, whatever it is, they're having to be competitive. And suddenly there's this platform where they're getting scores. And for people who are inherently competitive to get a score, this is a sustainability score that, that tells them where they stand relative to peers, it's a big deal and a big motivator. And so what I found very interesting while I was at CalPERS is how managers would react to their scores and how the sort of anticipation of knowing they were going to be scored led to them making just more thoughtful decisions about how they were managing assets and more proactive decisions that in some ways unlocked value, improved governance, and just you know, made, made our, our assets more sustainable. So it was a, you know, those are some of the benefits. Maybe I'll stop there. That's amazing. I, so Beth, I've not heard you say that before. And it's funny because I often talk about this competitive race to the top that Gresb stokes. And you just hit the nail on the head. I'm glad that you observed that and, and offered that here because it's spot on with things that I've been observing uh, writ large for, for years. Yeah, it's amazing how everyone wants to be at the top, but you can only have one person at the top. But everyone's like, "How do I get to be that one at the top?" And yeah. I, I one hundred percent agree. There's nothing like good old fashioned competition um, to uh, help spur things forward. But the one thing I've always noted too, which was pretty great of this industry in particular, is that everyone would still share, right? Like even though everyone wanted to get to the top, it's a unique industry where everyone wanted to kind of share best practices. They wanted to be able to hone in on, and this is one thing I find really helpful with Grez, is hone in on specific areas that you could now see, okay, here's how I'm doing compared to all of Grez. Here's how I'm doing compared to my peers within Grez. Here's how I'm doing compared to myself from last year. And so when you're doing that performance monitoring, in addition to that peer competitiveness, I think it's the the combination of the two that um, is impactful. But it's interesting for me to hear too that you're even potentially utilizing that as a tool from that that investor side, right? Of like, okay, so how are you doing compared to your peers? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of well, I, I would say, I mean, it's kind of it's it's interesting in that I. I found myself, and I, I guess I would still say that to any manager I talk to, not so much to worry about the score. Like I, as an investor, I actually liked reading through the reports to get the information and to understand not just what changed. I mean, for instance, a new asset that might be reporting to Grez for the first time, I would get an understanding of it at a deeper level um, than I might have gotten in other ways. And so I found that very helpful just to understand the asset better through all these different metrics. But what I found interesting, it wasn't so much that the manager relative to their peers, because sometimes, for instance, we would have managers that, that didn't quite have peers that were the right comparison. And that mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily it. But it was almost the score by score, the fact that they were scored. 
Mm-hmm. I think was also a motivating factor. And, you know, I, I do think though, it is important to step back. And I, and I think there is sometimes manager fatigue. So to talk about the dark side uh, of this, um, where managers will say, you know, should I be focused on getting more points? Is this, am I, am I focused on the right things? And I would always want to say to managers, and I, I do it, which is really, let's focus on what's material what matters for your assets and what makes sense and where where you can find the alignment between value creation, so economic value creation, and also you know improving the sustainability of performance. So it shouldn't just be about the scores. It's just that they happen to have the side benefit of focusing their minds, I think. Well, and having a tangible maybe element to look back to, I think is what yeah. that additional step does. But I yeah. want 100% agree with you in terms of really honing in on the materiality and telling your story effectively. And I come across it frequently with our clients where they'll sometimes get hung up, especially on the performance indicator side of like, well, for the real estate specifically, I'm thinking of, but I, I know I'm going to score low because I have this challenge. And it's like, that's okay. You can still really tell your story effectively of mm-hmm. look at all these other things that I'm yeah. doing. Yes, there was a low score here, but it doesn't matter. I've se- separated that out. I'm able to see here's what my next step is. This is what's really material to me for X, Y, and Z reason. So, um, but I do think it helps kind of give you some topics to categorize the different um, aspects of those conversations. I don't know if you found that that from your side of communicating with some of these, you know, investments that when you could reference a benchmark or a framework, does that help with that communication of being able to say like, here's something that you can go and look at from kind of the back and forth. Was that ever part of it as well? I think, especially right now, and so in in the work I do now, I interact with a lot of new managers with sustainable investment strategies. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are not quite sure what what reporting frameworks make sense to use. They were looking, what are the metrics that are the right ones to use for their various strategies across the private assets? And so I think where we can give clarity to managers and say, here's what we'd like you to report on and focus. And by the way, multiple other investors are also using the same framework. It, it's helpful for them because I think right now there's a lot of confusion and wasted time, frankly, amongst the managers on what did, what do LPs want? Like, what am I supposed to do for them? And they're putting up their hands or they're not quite sure. And so giving them something that's clear, that has a time frame, is, I think, a helpful thing. And where it's something that they that is un- understandable and doesn't change so much from year to year, that also provides clarity. Um, but to, to the question or to the point, Michelle, you were making about managers sort of being afraid of low scores. I mean, that is something that does hold people back from from you know, trying out a survey like this and using it. And so I do think it's very important as LPs also to to explain to managers, listen, it's not just about you, you know, what score you're at now. We want to understand. We want to understand the asset. We want to track it over time and get them started. Because once they do the work of putting it all into, you know, a platform, a survey, you know, this this is one particular one for real assets. There are other types of surveys, but giving a coherency to them and a process and getting them started, I think is, is really something useful you can do as an LP. Um, that totally feeds what I talk about a lot, which are random acts of sustainability that are happening out there. And how do you like corral them yeah. into a more cogent, not only communication story, but also a you know sort of a go forward business strategy and, and implementation issue. What I've often seen are organizations that will do GRES and they'll score low and nearly everybody starts off with a low score. That's just how it is, right? You're learning a new language, you're trying to corral information from around the organization. What's great is when a 17 turns into a 34, which turns into a 51, right? That's 100% growth each year and it's up and to the right. Yeah. What's a bad day is if your 17 turns into a 19, that turns into a 16, that turns into a 22. Mm-hmm. That trend line says, I don't care, I'm exhausted, yeah. whatever, this is a check the box exercise at best. Yeah. And those are the, the difficult conversations that you're playing defense on your heels versus playing offense that I watch managers get in trouble. Right. Yeah, and I think, I mean, for LPs too, I think it's it's important to be clear with GPs about what, what your expectations are. Like, why are you asking them to do this if you are? Um, I, I do think that, you know, one of the most exciting moments I, I had, and I had this experience a couple of times, I won't even say which asset type or anything related to the managers, but where I hadn't even read a manager's gross report, this happened twice, and the manager called and said, I've already got a plan to address everything. 
and said, can I meet, can I get on your calendar and talk to you about it? And then sort of came in, had a PowerPoint. Here's what we're going to do. We've are, you know, we've, here's, we're allocating this resource to, to solve this problem. And, and it was just amazing. They had taken it very seriously, seen what they needed to address, had, had actually realized they had risks. They didn't, they weren't managing, but they didn't understand. And it was, um, I mean, that was a wonderful, that was a wonderful outcome, I would say. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's the uh, another question to consider. So, um, from the, your your Calpers days, when after the results came out, did you actually read the results? Did it take yeah. you like a week, two weeks, just out of curiosity? What what timeline are we talking about here? You know. <laughs> I think, you know, by the way, I, I wasn't the only person at, at Calpers there's, and there's some amazing people there still, still reading through the surveys. You know, I think it really depends on when LPs do this and, and certain managers, you might be more excited to jump into their report than others or new assets. You might like, that might be the top of the list. Um, sometimes if you're looking at trends over time, you might sort of start with sort of how does it trend it over time? And sort of we, you know, I, I know some LPs sort of pull the data out and want to see that, that trend. Um, uh, so, you know, I think it really depends on what else is going on. It could be the case that some reports m might not have gotten read for a month or so. I don't, you know, I think some probably got read like right away because we were very <laughs> curious, but, but, you know, to the, to the anecdote I was just telling like that manager, I don't know if I would have gotten to the report for uh, maybe even a couple months, but after they called, I, you know, I read that report right away. <laughs> so. I mean, that's the question everyone wants to know. I, yeah. <laughs> how much time do I have to communicate what, what happened here, yeah. but in the best way possible. I think um, that's also good to have them have an opportunity to review their own scores first yeah. and, and, and sort of be able to talk about them so they can answer questions. I mean, I know that's something where a lot of LPs who, who do PRI, for instance, um, you know, a common practice among sort of sustainable investment groups within big pension funds is that they will work with the different asset classes. And then when the asset class gets the score and they might work with this, they might share it specifically with that representative at sort of maybe the more junior representative who filled it out before it goes to the senior person, just so that they can contextualize it. Because I think that's an important thing to be able to do to say, okay, well, we got the score. Here's why. Here's why it changed from year to year. It might have been the case that, you know, GRESB or PRI changed the, the criteria. It might have been that they changed the questions. And so being able to to explain that, I think, is a helpful thing because um, it's not all about scores, right? Well, no, that's spot on. So last year we made some tweaks to the assessment. We broke out management and performance a little bit more clear, clearly and scores dropped. And yeah. we had people that wanted that time to you know, be able to understand and contextualize and be able to communicate internally. So that's key. We've also introduced this review period. So on September 1st, all of the participants receive their preliminary scores. And there's two reasons for this. One is to kind of give them a, a heads up as to where things are in the benchmark as it stands right now. The second is to look for any flaws that happened in the data as it was coming in or some, uh, you know, the potential for one or two mistakes that may happen during the validation period. This doesn't really happen often, but to give, you know, another 1500 pair of eyes on the assessments as they came in, in yeah. the month of September is something that we instituted last year and it turned out to be uh, well received. Yeah. yeah, I think that was a very valuable exercise even from like our end when we were supporting with these clients with going through their grad submission, being able to, I think you touched on it, Dan, of having their eyes on it before the investors had eyes on it so that they could really have that story to tell effectively on and almost to the story you mentioned, Beth, of being able to be like, okay, I know my results. I know these are the areas I specifically want to focus on. These are the great stories that I'm excited to share with you. These are the additional areas that we have to grow. This is our game plan to doing it. Yeah. And having that time to do that, I thought was more attainable the yeah. second time around or this last year because of that additional review period. Yeah. So. Yeah, because I think, you know, a lot of these surveys when they were started by investors, so the original group that got together with the Global Infrastructure Sustainability Council, you know, all these calls, you know, we wanted this to be, you know, I, I guess a standard that, that really developed over time. And, and at first, our, you know, one of the main goals was to get everyone to put data into the um, into the survey. But then we, and we had it to the point where it wasn't that any specific infrastructure asset would be judged unsustainable versus another. So a coal plant would be judged relative to another coal plant, but it wouldn't be marked as a coal plant versus a solar plant. 
Now that said, it was all, we always thought, you know what, at some point we have to be able to say what is actually a sustainable asset. And so it was always designed that things would evolve over time and that the definition of, of what is sustainable in terms of infrastructure would, would be a tighter definition as things progressed. And so, you know, I don't know where things exactly are where you're thinking right now, but. It would... So cool you brought that up. So we are working on the, you know, the assessment roadmap, the roadmap to 2024. And when we made that change last year, management performance, we separated it more clearly. It's to now define better what is performance or, or evolve it, right? Because a lot of our performance, particularly on the real estate side, was can you acquire the data, which the right. industry couldn't a decade ago. No one was tracking right. the financials. Yes. Consumption, yeah. no. And infra is, you know, basically the same thing. Financials, yes, but all these other metrics, no way. So now that the industry has been seasoned, that these things are important, these material aspects, you know, whatever it is for the asset, okay, now what is good, better, best when it comes to implementation on the ground, right? That's where we're all heading. But in order to do this effectively, we're to, we need to talk to our member base. And that means Australia and the UK and the EU yeah. and the US and South yeah. America and everybody in between. Yeah. No, I, it was a little bit like the United Nations sometimes on the on the Grest councils I was involved with over time. Um, and because there's a lot to think about and people have different incumbent portfolios and they're evolving over time. But I think at the, you know, at the end of the day, as investors thinking about where the world's going and as the as you know, it, it becomes more clear what is a sustainable asset and what's not, what's actually going to make the transition towards a sustainable economy. It's one where you'd almost have to have that, that sort of meta level above Grest where you'd step back and say, all right how sustainable is my portfolio, even regardless of what my scores are. And so hopefully over time, though, Grez can just do that for you. Well, and I think it comes down to as well, I hear the question a lot of like, what does good look like? Right. Yeah. And I think that's a constantly evolving, changing uh, end goal. And that maybe isn't fully definitive and is dependent on multiple variables. But that's, I think, the heart of what we're trying to get at is what does good look like? What are my plans? What is the forward thinking path? look like and where how do i get there um so it's, it's interesting how these things come together if you consider the questions in grez right they're they're worded as boolean yes or no so as soon as you click yes then a series of elements open up and once you start clicking those things it's basically good better best do you yeah. communicate on your website okay now you're communicating you're helping transparency which drives capital markets versus are you doing an integrated financial report that's best so it's rare that companies are doing that, but what we do is we give them the pathway forward and we show that there are actually some peers that are publishing integrated reports. So guess what? It's possible. What do you want to do about it? Make a business decision. Well, maybe that's a great way of uh, kind of closing out our, our quick little um, connection today and um, conversation, but I would like to maybe end with, or feel free to throw out anything else, guys, but just where do you think that next step is then? Like if you're thinking ahead in terms of either what the investors are looking at or what these, you know, different assets should be thinking about, these different investments should be thinking about funds and what have you, like what does that next step look like that we should be thinking about um, looking a little bit more forward? Mm -hmm. Beth, I'll let you, if you don't mind, I'm gonna put you on the spot or if you want to yeah. switch, you're welcome you to. Know, I guess top of mind, you know, is, is one thing I'm actually thinking about related to, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the impact management framework and and, and that sort of group and how they've developed um, so this ABC framework. But it's, mm -hmm. um, it's this concept that you look at assets and they could either be sort of avoiding harm, they could be benefiting stakeholders, or they could be contributing to solutions. And when I think about, um, you know, the very important role that real assets plays, for instance, related to climate change, and also with interactions related to the natural world and natural capital. Um, I do think that there are certain assets that could be considered contributing to solutions. So these are your renewable energy assets that are well cited and well thought through and maybe um, are contributing to, to a solution related to climate change, or even um, you know a nature-based solution that's providing both carbon sequestration and also habitat. And I'd want to almost see those categories of defined in such a way that 
that things that are, are marked as sustainable or good get that type of, of, of review and maybe a scoring based on that. And we can kind of understand and see what that spectrum is. So, so I'm thinking about outcomes and, and sort of the impacts related to, to these investments, but that's, uh, that's top of mind for me. So cool you said that. So we're yeah. working on the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and yeah. how an asset contributes or detracts from mm -hmm. those goals. So right. the UN SDG, that's a project that's happening right now at Grez, yeah. and right. there are obviously positive contributions, as you pointed out, but even some of the assets that make, are, make super positive contributions still have some negative externalities. Sure. So there's yeah. not going to be a perfect scorecard or grade, but this right. is something that we want to offer to the marketplace. And we've had a lot of the really major infrastructure managers, uh, their eyes perk up and they, they're very supportive of what we're trying to do. And so look for that um, knock on wood and by the yeah. end of the year. Yeah. yeah. But just to just to say one additional thing, which is I don't want to dismiss the fact that it is very important to take our incumbent, you know, our, the portfolio of, of assets that already exist related to real estate and infrastructure and improve their sustainability performance, because they have a huge role to play related to emissions. And and that's also where I think Resb is such an important uh, tool for, you know, for improvement. So um, great. No, I, I love that. I think that's a great kind of forward thinking idea to have kind of front and center as we wrap up our call for today. But um, Beth, thank you so much for joining us. The perspective was amazing, really helped bring additional things to light. And uh, we'll we'll try to have you back again because I think this is a lot of fun. Um, but, um, and Dan, of course, to, to you as well. And uh, thank you guys so much for the time today. And it was great to speak with everyone and looking forward to the rest of uh, 2021. Just crazy, we're halfway through. Thank you guys. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. All right, bye-bye.